Hello guys and today this is the mid dude and today we're doing Edexcel Chemistry Unit 1 January 2009. So let's get right to it. So we have question number one. So which equation represents the reaction for which the enthalpy changes the lattice energy of sodium fluoride? Now if you remember correctly this is to do with born Haber cycle. So born Haber cycle. Born Haber cycles. And the key thing here is they're asking for the lattice energy of the, the compound NaF. Now if you look here, I got I have this diagram over here which shows how we get from an element or metal here and a gas here to get this compound here. Now what you can notice here is that the key thing here is that we, we're only dealing with gaseous ions. So gaseous ions is what we're dealing with. So if in the answer we need to have gaseous ions right so if we see here you can see that a does not have gaseous ions neither does b neither does d the only answer that has gaseous ions na plus gas plus fe minus gas that goes to naf solid that's the only one that has gaseous ions and you can see over here lattice energy goes from m so over here in this example m plus plus x minus gas goes to mx solid which in this case is also the same thing. So we can conclude that C is the right answer. So moving on. Theoretical lattice energies can be calculated from electrostatic theory. Which of the following affects the magnitude? Magnitude, which is also the size. Size of the theoretical lattice energy of an alkali metal halide. So what are the things that actually affect the magnitudes of uh, lattice energies in general? So the things that affect them are what? ionic charge right ionic charge and the size of the ionic radius size of the ionic radius so these are the only two, two things you can you can think of that uh, they can change the size or the magnitude of a lattice energy we know that they tell us that the alkali metal halide are going to have m plus charge and x minus charge so we can cross out we can cross out the ionic charge because this is constant because this is constant the charge aren't going to change right we're not going to get m2 plus and x2 minus at all so the only thing that we can really look for is the only thing that can change the size of the lattice energy is the size of size of the ionic radius which in this case is our option D and why is that because a B C don't talk about the radius or the ionic charge at all so we can conclude that D is the answer over here let's move on question number three which of the following which of the following graphs show the variation in the ionic radius of the group two elements so I have this periodic table here and we can we can show show what's going on here and say that so this is group two and we have so we have beryllium we have magnesium, calcium, and strontium. What happens as you go down the group? When you go down the group, what's happening to it? The ionic radius is actually increasing. Why is it increasing? Because we have more, more shells, right, being added as you go down the group, right? More shells being added, more protons, bigger nucleus, right? So more shells, bigger nucleus, right? And because of that, the ionic radius will also increase because there's there are more shells, there's a bigger nucleus. So this the size of the strontium ion is going to be much much larger uh, of the compared to the beryllium ion. So we should see a linear increase, a linear increase in the ionic radius. So if I if I write this as ionic radius, we should see we should see an increase. So we should see the graph we should see BR, so BE, MG, CA, and SR. We should see an increase in uh, the ionic radius. So let's see which graph corresponds to what we have just described. So it's not A because it goes down, so we can cancel A. It's not, it's not uh, B because it's going down, that's not what we want. It's not D either. So the only one we can see that, that correlates is C. So C is our answer because it linearly increases and that's what we want okay so question number four the first five ionization energies of an element are this 
Okay, so we got 790, 1600, 3200, uh, 4400, and 16100 kilojoules per mole. Now we want to find out which group this PRD, this element is in. So what we have to do, we, we have to look for the big, big jump, the big jump. Now what do I mean by the big jump? I mean to say what's the difference between each ionization energy. So from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. So what's actually happening when we take these ionization energy? We're taking one electron away, two electrons away, three electrons away, four moles of electrons. So they're actually moles of electrons. Four moles of electrons away, five moles of electrons away. Corresponding to the five values, right? So what are th what, what's the difference between these values? So we have 810, then we have 1600, then we have 1200, then we have 11,700. 11, so you can see there's a big jump between the fourth electron and the fifth electron. That means after you take four away, element Z is now stable, is now stable. By stable, what do we mean? We mean a full outer shell. Now, because you mean a full outer shell, we're talking about that this means that Z has four valence electrons. And because it has four valence electrons, we can conclude and say that the group of element Z has to be C. It has to be four, group four. Okay. So, question number five. The standard enthalpies of combustion of carbon, hydrogen, and methane are shown in the table below. Which of the following expresses the gives the correct value for the standard enthalpy, standard enthalpy or change of formation in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so let's look at the values we have here. Let's just put the values. So the values for this is what? Minus 394. What's the value of this? So we have two hydrogen molecules, so we know that the answer should be two times this. So we have two times minus 286. And for this, we have minus 891 on its own. Okay. By rule of thumb, you should know that the enthalpy is usually the bonds broken, bonds broken, which is an endothermic process. So you should have a plus sign here, positive sign. And we add it to the bonds made, bonds made, which is an exothermic process. So you should have, you should need to add a negative sign once you're adding calculation. So what bonds are being broken here? Where the only bonds that are bro being broken here are the left hand side, right? The reactant side, because because the, the bond between hydrogen is being broken, right? So we can say we can conclude and say that the enthalpy change with this would be minus three nine four, right? Plus two times minus two eight, so two times minus two eighty six. Now I would say plus again, but you have to add the negative sign for the bonds made because it's a, it's an exothermic process. So Instead of writing the plus, we can straight away and we can straight away write the negative sign, and then we can write the value minus eight nine one. So when we simplify this, our equation should our 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 expression should look like minus three nine four, right? And then then plus two, so minus two times two eight six, two eight six, plus eight nine one. So now we just need to look at which ones which ones correlate to this expression we got here. And you can see that it's not A, so we can cancel A. It's not, I, is it B minus 394 minus two times 286 plus 891, so it's B. It's the same thing here. So yeah, you can also, you can also see that this refers to the carbon, this refers to the 2H2, and this refers to the CH4. Okay, so just to clarify. Okay, question number six. So this question is about some enthalpy changes. So we have the enthalpy of reaction, which is the enthalpy of the reaction on its own. We have the enthalpy of combustion, where we have a compound that combusts and access oxygen. So uh, co fully combusts, that is the enthalpy of combustion. And we have mean bond enthalpy, where I've, I've given a little definition here, where mean bond enthalpy is, is to do with the average, uh, average energy required to break the covalent bond into gaseous atoms. And in there, these are recorded through various molecules. So these ones are scientifically, so these ones are scientific, scientifically proven and normalized. The other ones, 
the next one with bond entropy is to do with specific bond specific bonds really important okay so we only talk about a specific bond not an average not not just any bond it's just the specific bond okay so which enthalpy change uh, is represented by p so we have we have methane here that splits up into ch3 and h gas on its own so I, i've got this diagram here we have this molecule you can uh, imagine this as the molecule ch4 right so we have c h h h ch4 we have the bond enthalpy they break up into their molecular fragments which is the case here we have c h h free radical plus h here so we can conclude that this is only a specific bond so the answer should be bond enthalpy which is d in this case because it refers back to the bond enthalpy next which ent which enthalpy change is represented by q so CH4 goes into completely into carbon and for hydrogen. And they're telling you that the enthalpy change is four times Q. So what they're referring to is this here, right? They're, they're talking about this enthalpy change that goes from methane, so breaking the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. So we have four times breaking the bond of CH, right? So that means we're talking about the enthalpy change of this would be the mean bond enthalpy, right? Because you're doing four times, it's not the average anymore, is it? It, it, sorry, it is the average. It's the average now. It's not specific. It's to do with the average. So it's C. Which enthalpy change is represented by R? So we have a compound here, a hydrocarbon that reacts with oxygen to give us CH2, CH2, and then we have a uh, double bond O here. So you can see that that they don't fully combust because usually when you combust something, you, you either get an oxide. So you either get an oxide, water, yeah oxides or water that's what you usually get and in this case you can see that there are no oxides so we can rule out combustion there are no uh, bond enthalpies required here because nothing's happening here we're not breaking we're not breaking anything there are no specific bonds neither are there splitting up so because they're it's a, it's a synthesis react you can see this is synthesis that you have two molecules in the beginning and you end up with one so it's not mean bond enthalpy neither is it bond enthalpy so this must be the enthalpy of reaction the enthalpy of reaction is a so the answer over here is a okay so next question so question number seven so you've been given values you've been given these values select the expression which gives the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole for the reaction 2 feo solid plus half oxygen half o2 gives us fe2o3 so they've given us half the uh, answer already. So what we have to do is, is we have to develop we have to develop a Hess cycle. I've I've gone through a Hess cycle. So I have I've, I've gone here and we have we, how do we make this Hess cycle? So what are the constituent parts of in, in in this reaction? So we have iron, right, and we have oxygen. How many of them? We have three oxygen and we have two Fe, right? So we know that this 2Fe can easily, this is the only way it can form, it goes all the way here. And this enthalpy of formation is already given to us. You can see over here. So we can put this over here. So that I'm going to name, so I'm just going to write minus 820, right? And then we have another enthalpy of formation over here. But you can see here, this is 2FeO. So we need to do two times the first one. So I'm, I'm going to so two times this first one here, right? Two times minus 270. And the enthalpy of reaction is going to be delta HR. So how do we get from, how do we get delta HR? How do we get this enthalpy change? Now the way I do it is we look at the direction of where they're going. So if we label this step one, step two, and step three, we can say that one plus two equals step three right and we want what step two is so two would be two would be three take away one which in this case would be minus 820 right take away take away minus so this would be two times minus 270 right and you can see here this is the same thing as saying minus times another minus so this is the same thing as saying so if you put this in the calculator you would see that this is minus 820 plus 2 times 270, which gives us minus 280. 
And you can see here, we have an answer minus 280, which is C. So C is the correct answer here of the enthalpy of reaction. Enthalpy of reaction here. Okay. Question number eight. An organic compound contains 38.4% carbon, 4.8% hydrogen, and 56.8% chlorine. By mass, what is its empirical formula? So the way we do it is we con convert this percentage into grams because they all add it to 100. So we do that. So we get 38.4 grams. Then we have 4.8 grams and 56.8 grams. And then what we do is we divide by the MR. So the first step, we convert into grams. Second step, we divide by MR, the molecular mass. So in this case, it would be 12. In this case, it would be 1. In this case, it would be 35.5. Um, and where did I get that? I got that from here. So 12 over here, 35.5 chlorine here, and 1 over here. So we can conclude. So this would be, so when we divide this, you'd get this is 4.8, this is 1.6, and this is 3.2. Then third step is you divide by the smallest number. So divide by smallest number to get the, the empirical formula, smallest number, to get the smallest ratio. So we, so we have to divide everything by 6, 1.6, 1.6, and divide by 1.6. So we will get 2, we get 3, we'll get 3, and 1, and 1. This correlates to carbon hydrogen and Cl, so our answer would be C2H3Cl. And that answer is A, and that is our final answer. Okay, so which of the, question number nine, which of the following contains the greatest number of hydrogen atoms? So it's pretty easy, what you do is you, the moles times the amount of hydrogen molecule, hydrogen atoms we have, so two times H2, this gives us four hydrogen atoms, and then we have 1.5 times H3. So we have 3 times 1.5, which is 4.5 hydrogen atoms. And then we have 1 times H2. That gives us 2 hydrogen atoms. And then we have 0 0.5 times 4 hydrogens, which gives us so it's a half, so 2 hydrogens again. As you can see, the, the biggest number is, is our option B. So that is our answer for greatest number of hydrogen atoms. OK, so MgO. So magnesium oxide reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid according to the following. How many moles, so that's in bold, how many moles of magnesium oxide are required to neutralize, neutralize 20 centimeter cubed and hydrochloric acid? So the first thing I notice here is that they're talking about the moles. So I write down the equation N equals CV or N equals mass over molar mass. And I see which one, which one, would, uh, which one would help us in this question. So are we, are we being given the mass or a molar mass? No, but we can find the molar mass obviously because we have the periodic table. But in this case, you can see that they've given us concentration and volume. So I know that I'm going to use uh, N equals CV in this question. So that's just a tip. Second thing, we need to now look at the molar ratio. You can see this is a one to two ratio, right? So now we need to look at, now we need to find the moles of hydrochloric acid so we can find the moles of magnesium oxide required, right? So. So now we're going to N of HCl, uh, HCl. So that would be uh, our concentration, which is 0 0.5 moles, times our volume. Now our volume has to be in dm cubed, so we have to make 20 centimeter cubed. So 20 centimeter cubed into dm cubed. So how do we do that? We divide by a thousand. So we get 20 divided by a thousand. We get 0 0.01 moles. Now, if HCl is 0 0.01 moles, and we know it's a 1 to 2 ratio, all we have to do to find the moles of MgO is divide moles of HCl by 2, right? So you get 0 0.005, or you can do a ratio method, or which is, so I do this, so I do MgO ratio HCl, and then I do it's a 1 to 2 ratio, so I then and I I need to know what MgO is, so I'll just call it X, and this is 0 0.01, and then I cross multiply, so cross multiply here and here, so you get 2x equals 0 0.01 times 1, which is 0 0.01. So our moles for MgO is 0 0.01 divided by 2, which gives us the same answer 0 0.005. So our final answer is B 0 0.005. Okay, so question number 11. 
So hydrogen reacts, uh, hydrogen often react uh, according to the following equation. If all volumes are measured at 110 degrees uh, Celsius and one atmospheric pressure, the volume of steam produced at 50 centimeter cubed hydrogen reacts completely with 25 centimeter cubed oxygen. What is the, what is the volume of steam? Right. So the first thing we need to know is that in these types of questions, we need to now look at the temperature. The, the temperature in the question says all volumes are measured at 100 degrees C. So that means that if all volumes are, that means that we know that one mole of, uh, of any gas usually occupies 24 dm cubed, right? 24 dm cubed at room temperature, right? But in this case, it's 100 degrees C, right? It's 100 degrees Celsius. So what we need to know and we need to understand is that if let's say at 110 degrees hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen produces say 36 uh, dm cubed, right? At 110 or 200, let's say 200. The same amount is going to be produced for oxygen. So it, it's a proportionality thing. So you need to understand that the temperature in this scenario does not matter. We need to disregard the temperature. It's just there to confuse us, okay? The second thing is we need to understand that the moles don't add up, do they? Because you can see here the two plus one in, in the reactant side does not add up to two here, does it? So we, we know that there must be a limiting factor here. There needs to be a limiting factor here. And another thing we need to know is that the volumes are also not going to add up, are not also going to add up. They're not going to add up. So let's see why. So we have uh, 50 centimeter cubed of this, so this is two moles of it, and it needs to react with one mole of 25 centimeter cubed. That means that 25 centimeter cubed of oxygen is only going to react with 25 centimeter cubed of hydrogen, right? So that means we're gonna get a total of 50 centimeter cubed of steam, right? Because oxygen is our limiting reagent. So what? So if the question asks us, what's the total volume, right? Total volume, then we would say it would be 50 gram, 50, not grams, sorry, 50 centimeter cubed. I do not know why I put grams. 50 centimeter cubed of steam. And we'd have 25 centimeter cubed of unreacted hydrogen so we have unreacted hydrogen that we have not done anything we have done nothing with so our final answer is 50 because they ask us for steam not the total volume 50 okay but if they ask us for the total you also know that you know how to do that now as well <laughs> okay question number 12 hydrogen peroxide decomposes on heating as following so you can see here so what mass of hydrogen peroxide so they're asking for mass so i already know we're going to do n equals mass over molar mass that's the only equation that has mass is required to give 16 grams of oxygen gas so you can see here we're, we're looking at hydrogen peroxide in relation to oxygen so i can just do h 2 o2 o2 you can see the molar ratio is 2 to 1 right so 16 grams of oxygen, you can see this in O2 is a diatomic uh, molecule. So if you if you wanted to work out N of O2, so that would be 16 divided by 32. That give us 0 0.5. So this is 0 0.5. So we now need to find the mold of hydrogen peroxide. This is a 2 to 1 ratio. So whatever mold we have of oxygen, we just uh, times it by 2. So when you times this by 2, you should get 1. Right, so this is what we're looking for. So 1 mole, uh, so now we're looking at now we're doing one mole of hydrogen peroxide so that was one equals mass over molar mass the molar mass of hydrogen peroxide so that's uh, 2 plus 16 plus 16 by 2 it's I mean it's 1 plus 1 the hydrogen 1 plus 1 there are two there are two of the hydrogen so 1 plus 1 plus 1 that gives us 34 so we have one equals mass over 34 so our mass is 34 grams that is our mass required to give 16 grams of oxygen gas okay so question number 13 the equation of for the dehydration of cyclohexanol is given is given to cyclohexene is given by this and they tell us that 50 grams 50 grams produces this much and they also tell us that the molar mass of uh, cyclohexanol are 100 and cyclohexene are 82. so we, we need to work out the percentage yield so what is, how do you work a percentage yield? Now percentage yield we work out by, it's 
it's our experimental value right experimental value that we get from our from our from our thing divided by the theoretical answer we should get times by 100 obviously so now we need to look at if a now we need to look at what's going on here so molar masses of cyclic stars are 100 so 100 produces 82 82 of cyclohexene right but we're only using 50 grams so we have to divide our 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 molar masses by 2 right so if 50 grams is being used that means that if 50 grams is being used we're going to get half of 82 which is 41 that is the maximum which, that's the maximum I can get so this is the max right this is the max this means this is the theoretical maximum value we should get right our experimental value is 32.8 divided by our maximum value which is 41 and we times it times that by 100 and we get this is 80 percent so our, our answer is D okay question number 14 so how many isomers are there for C5 H12 which is this is pentane right you can you can just draw them if, if you do not remember them. I'll just draw them in skeletal uh, skeletal formula so we have one two three four five that's one then we have one two three four five so this is our second so this is our first isomer second isomer our third isomer is one two three one two three four and we have five here that's our third isomer so these are our isomers so this is just pentane this is a uh, butane with a methyl group this is a, a profile this is a dimethyl group on a propane so this one so this one's uh, pentane right this one's uh, what's it methyl butane methyl butane butane so this would be two methyl butane this would be a uh, di dimethyl dimethyl so this would be two 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 dimethyl propane so that's what we have here so we know that this is three isomers here okay in a molecule of ethene how many pi bonds are there present you can see in this diagram this is just to illustrate this is from the book uh, the the new spec book so you can see here this says so this one may think this is two there are two bonds there but no there's only one pi bond here that has two lobes that has two lobes on either either end of either side of the carbon carbon double bond so that means that you only have one ethene we only have one pi bond present here okay so the mechanism of the reaction represented by the equation c2h4 plus br2 is given by this so what is this an example of so we could just draw this and see see the see for ourselves so we have we have CH2, right? And then we have CH2 here. Reacts with our bromine, right? Bromine. They have positive and negative charge. And we know that they become this and this goes out. So you're left with, so we have CH2Br, check. So what we end up with is we got a CH2 molecule, so I'll just make it simpler. So we get a we get a CH2 over here, right? And this is a CH2 here, a single bond now. It's a plus here, and it takes the Br over here, right? And then you have you're left with this Br minus that goes into here, correct? But before that happens, this is a plus. Before that happens, so this before this happens, this Br becomes a plus. And this plus is an electrophile. This is an electrophile, right? And because it's an electrophile, we're adding this electrophile to this bond that's been opened up. So that means we're adding an electrophile. So that means the answer is electrophilic addition. Okay, because we want to gain an electron to attain stability. Okay. So question number seven. What is the systematic name for the following compound? So you can see here they use the prefixes Z, E, Z, E, e and Z. So I always remember this as Z, Z, uh, Z. I always remember as Zame, Zame, which is 
me trying to think it's same same by same same I mean at either end they have this so this is same same that's what I trying to say and this is E the end gigan I, I refer to this one's the Z same same okay so let's see what what so how do we name uh, how do we name a compound we look at the longest chain the longest chain in this case is this so how many of uh, what's the longest chain here why is this the longest chain and not a C not from here that's because you can see there's a C2 here and not uh, so you can have the longest chain that's why that's the longest chain okay so how many carbons are there one two three four five and six so there's six there right so we can get rid of the pent 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 ones so we can get rid of the pent ones so e and uh, b and c are gone so now we're left with hex so now we're left with now we're left with uh, now we're left with this so we have we're left with this so you can see over here that both so we have so we can see it's the double bond is here right the bonds here and you can see here that it's uh it's this so we have see this 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 the main the main groups that are the largest groups are this the upper left and the lower right and that corresponds to our e right corresponds to our e so we know that the answer has to be d because it's E, it's not the same, same. We don't have the same groups on either side. They're two different, both sides are on different ends. That's why it's D. Okay, so propene reacts with hydrochloric acid gas to give mainly, to give mainly what? So what, what we need to remember is that we need to now look at what's going on. So propene has the what formula? We have, it's it has C3, right? It has C, C3, right? And how many, how many hydrogens it has? Six hydrogens, right? Reacts with HCl, correct? To give us, give us what? Usually gives us what? It gives us CH. So we have usually have CH. How many carbons do we have? We have three carbons still, and then what? Then we have one, two, three, right? Four, five, six, seven. So we have H7Br. This is what we usually get, right? Oh, sorry, H7Cl. So we only get one chlorine. So if we can, if we find any any chlorine that any Answer that has two chlorines, we can get we can get rid of it, right? Or it, or uh, an alkene bond, because you don't get an alkene, we get an alkane now. We can see here D can be get rid got rid of because there are two chlorines. That's not what we want. Even C we can get rid of because there is an al there is a double bond, and that's not what happens, right? So we're now we're left with one chloropropane and two chloropropane. Now the major product for these types of reactions are usually two. So we enter the halogen name. Uh, propane so that's what we get so in this case there will be chloro so that's what we get that's why we get chloropropane but that's it's not one chloropropane because to do with the carbocation the 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 carbocation is more stable than the carbocation for one chloropropane so that's why we get an alkane and that's why we get the two chloropropane instead of the one chloropropane and that's the end of the Multiple choice. So now we move on to section B. So complete the electronic configuration of magnesium atom. So first we need to know how many electrons there are in magnesium, or using the periodic table we can get that. So if I just copy this, no, no. Okay, and we can go back. And magnesium over here. So we can see here magnesium, magnesium over here is, magnesium is over here. You can see there are 12 protons, right? So there must be 12, 12 electrons. So we keep going until we get 12, right? So what after the S we get what? We get another S, so that's 2S2. So that's a total of four now. Then we have uh, the P group, right? We have the P group, so that is 2P. 2p6 so now we have a total of 10 now we just need to add two more right so that's going to be 3s2 okay so that's the answer for this so our answer for this is 2s2 2p6 and 3s2 next complete the electronic configuration of of if i move this way of the chlorine atom so the chlorine atom let's look at the chlorine atom now 
So the chlorine atom has 17 protons. It has 17 protons, right? See, it has 17 protons. That means it's going to have 17 electrons. So with that, with knowing that, so we now need to do the same thing we did before. So we have 2s2, and then we have 2p6. Our, our total now is 4, now it's 10, then we have 3s, we have 3s2, 3s2, so that's a 12, and now we need to add what? We need to add 5, right? We need to add 5, so that's going to be 3p5, so that's our 17. So this is the electronic configuration of chlorine. Let me just make it here, okay. Write down the equation including state symbols including state symbols for the reaction between magnesium and chlorine. That's pretty standard. So we have usually magnesium is a solid. So we have magnesium in standard room temperature is magnesium solid and chlorine is usually a gas at room temperature. Uh, room temperature. And we need to remember that MgCl, you have its chlor chlorine is usually diatomic. So that's what we go for. And then we get MgCl2, right? Why do we get MgCl2 and not MgCl? It's because magnesium is usually a charge of 2 plus, and this is a charge of 2 minus, uh, sorry, 1 minus. So to cancel it out, we need 2 of chlorines to, to ionically bond with 1 magnesium atom. So name the type of bonding present in magnesium chloride. That's pretty simple. This is, a, uh, this is an ionic bond. This is an ionic, ionic bond. Okay, so next question says, Next question says, draw a diagram using dots and crosses, right? Dots and crosses, uh, dots and crosses to show the bonding in magnesium chloride. Include all the electrons, all of them in each species and the charges present. So it, the key thing here that they, they tell us, it's in bold, all of them, right? We need to do, show all of it. So how do we do that? We show it, so if we, so we'll show we'll do the, we'll do the dots for the M magnesium uh, electrons, right? Uh, electrons, and we will do crosses for the chlorine electrons. Okay, so let's see. So we have Mg. So how many did we say Mg has? Mg has how many shells? It has two s two shells. So it has a shell of two. So we can do that. So two s two here. Same over here, and then we have a two p six. We have a 2p6 here. So we have 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 2. So we have 1s2. So this is 1s2, 2s2. And we have gotten rid of the 3s2. Why we have we gotten rid of the 3s2? Because this is a 2 plus charge, right? Mg2 plus, right? So we have donated it to our chlorine, chlorine, our two chlorine molecules. So X. X, so we have this and then we have another shell and then we have another another shell here so that so we'll get XX so add, add 8 so this coin minus and then we add another another and another here and then we can have the MG here and we can just copy this. Copy it, so copy it, and then we just paste it. Let's make it smaller. And we can make this one smaller as well. No. We just make this small over here, so I just do like this. Okay, but you get the point. So, maybe if I just move this from here and try again, yeah. Yeah, okay, now I can probably do it. Yeah, so we have two chlorine molecules, and this one also. That's why this here. So these are two chlorine molecules, and this is our one Mg molecule over here. This would give you all the marks. 
Okay, so the next one, what type of bonding exists in solid magnesium? Now, we know the magnesium is a metal, right? So what type of uh, bonding that exists in magnesium is metallic bonding. So you can write metallic, metallic bonding. Okay, so next, the next question says, explain fully, explain fully why the melting temperature of magnesium is higher than of sodium. Now, what's the difference between Mg and Na? So, Na we know has a charge of plus, and we know Mg has a charge of 2 plus, right? So, right off the bat, we can say, we can say that magnesium, magnesium has a larger charge, a larger charge, or a big, uh, larger, larger charge, larger charge than Na, right? That's what we can say right on. So that, that will give us one mark, right? And then then what can we say? We can say, we, we can also say because this is a 2 plus charge, we know that its ionic radius, right? We know that its ionic radius is going to be smaller. Ionic radius is smaller, right? Okay. Now because we know that, we can conclude, right? We can say, we can say that Mg2 plus ions are smaller. Mg2 plus ions are smaller than Na plus ions, right? Because they have a larger ionic charge, so they pull more toward, and they have more protons, so they pull more toward the nucleus, right? So, then what? Then we can talk about, then we can talk about the energy required, right? Because the question says why the melting temperature is higher, right? So we need to talk about the energy required to overcome the forces of attraction. So what what they really like, right? The Edexpel people, they they really like the term the they really like the terms. So what what do we need to say? We need to say is that more energy, more energy, and if you don't write energy, you don't get the mark. You need to write energy or heat. So that so that's like a key thing here. More energy or heat. So that's the key term here. The larger charge is key here, and the smaller the ions are smaller than the other ion is key here. So that are the key things. So more energy is required. Is required. Required. So wh why do we need energy? So we can overcome the force of attraction. Required to overcome the force of attraction. Attraction between between what between m the magnesium ions mg ions and what what's in a metal what do what else do we have and the c of delocalized electron do we have c of delocalized electrons compared to in 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 mg compared to compared to Na. You don't have to write Na, you can write sodium and magnesium in normal, but I just prefer Na is much more simpler. You don't have to do that. Okay, so that's the answer for this. So I'd say the, the key point here is the energy, more energy, so let me just highlight that as well. More is important, more, 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 and larger, larger, and the keyword smaller. Okay. Okay, so that's fine. They mention bold, by the way. Uh, they also tell us what to reject. So they reject. So if I do it in red, they reject. If you just write, if you just write the following, if you just write uh, strong bonds, if you just write strong bonds in Mg, you'll get no mark. So strong bonds, strong bonds in Mg, you will get no marks. So strong bonds in Mg will not give you give you any any marks here. So it we also have to we have to be very specific in what we talk about. Okay, so 20A, we have a sample of gas, uh, uh, a gas sample of an element can be analyzed using a spectrometer. Describe briefly, briefly, how, how positive ions are formed from gaseous atoms in a mass spectrometer, right? So what actually happens in a mass spectrometer, right? So we know that electrons are what? Electrons are accelerated, right? Electrons are accelerated. What else? So, so acceleration is the key thing is so electrons are accelerated, right? So so that's the first step, right? 
Then what happens? This this then does what to it? This removes one mole of electron, which removes removes one. So I'll write one mole. So one mole of electrons. Right, one mole electron to make a positive ion. To make the positive ion. So the second key part here is that we're removing one mole of electron. You don't have to write one mole, you can just write remove one electron, right? You can talk about that. And if you if you just want to if you just wanted to if you just wanted to show this in an equation form, you can say we have uh, we have x here, we have this element here that goes to x plus plus e minus we have removed one electron and and it, and it has become positive so what is used to accelerate the positive ions in a mass spectrometer now what we use is either an electric field electrostatic field charge plates right but what we cannot use so this is what we reject right so this is so if you were thinking of, of the following things you do not talk about this if you say electrical current that is not what they want so electric current is not what they want what else don't they want? They don't want electric coil. They don't want electric coil. And they don't want magnetic field. So these are the things you need to watch out for if you were thinking these things. So the, the right answer is obviously electric field, right? So electric field is usually what we talk about. So electric field or charge plates. That, that's usually what you use. So I'm going to write electric field electric field so what is used so what is used to deflect the positive ions right deflect the positive ions now the only thing that we can use to deflect it is if we have charged plates right so we have positive here and a negative charged plate here right so don't that's the only way right we're going to get a deflection right because we have two charged plates so we can talk about magnetic plates so we can say so we can say these are magnetic magnetic plates okay the following data was obtained from the mass spectrum of a sample of chromium calculate the relative atomic mass of chromium in the sample give your answer to three significant figures so the three significant figures is very important so we can remember that for later so 3 sf now what i do with this is i make another column right make another column and i multiply all of these things and add them so what i do is i do 50 times 0 point this so whatever this is right 50 times that so i do 50 times so i do 50 times 4.3 percent right so so that would be if you check here so 50 times so 50 times 4.3 percent 4.3 percent so you get so you get 2.15 so 2.15 and then you do 52 times it so we, then we do plus 52 times 83.8 percent then do this 53.0 so 0 times 9.5 percent plus 54 54 times 2.4 percent and then we divide all of this by 100 okay so you, oh you don't have to drive by 100 actually you get the final answer because we already percent signed it so that would be 52 times 83.8 and that is 43.576 and then 53 times 9.5 percent so 53 times 9.5 percent that is 5.035 and then 54 54 times 2.4 percent that is 1.296 so now we have to add all them together. So if I do, so if we do 2.15 plus 
plus 5.035 plus 1.296 we get so we get 1.296 plus 5.035 plus 43.576 plus 2.15 we get 52.057 but that's not what they want this they want three significant figures so our final answer should be 52.1 that is our final answer 2.1 that's our final answer okay so next question explain why the four isotopes of chromium behave identically identically in chemical reactions so they're talking about chemical reaction now chemical reactions are to do with electrons right the sharing the the chain the swapping it's all to do with electrons right how how one element deals with another element with the sharing of electrons or taking away electrons or borrowing electrons so we know isotopes are what isotopes have what they have the same right they have the same electron configuration or the same total number total number of electrons hence why they hence why they behave huh, why the isotopes why the isotopes behave identically identically in chemical reactions okay so the key thing here is we have the same total number of electrons now what they do reject is they reject so if you talk about same number of protons on its own and you don't talk about electrons so name so if you say same number same number of protons only if you don't talk about electrons you will get no mark and if you were to talk about same number of outer electrons you'll also get no mark because outer electrons you ref this is referring to the group itself right this is referring to the group itself so this is not uh, this is not un this is not answering the question so if i can write this is not answering the question answering the question okay in which block of the periodic uh, table is chromium found you can this is a transition element and transition elements are usually found in the d block okay now define the term first ion ionization energy now an easy definition is it's the energy required right energy required so that's our first mark energy required so energy required first mark then second mark is energy required to remove one mole of electrons that's our second mark so the removing of electron one mole of electrons is our second mark and then the third mark is to state that these this is from from one mole of gaseous atoms so the gaseous atom one mole of it obviously gaseous atoms is important so you can write one mole of gases and this is also important the first thing so obviously this is the energy required to remove so the first part you can just write the energy required right the second two marks you can also get if you were to write x gas goes to x plus gas plus e minus this this alone can get you two marks this the the last two marks so the first mark is the energy required the last two mark you can just write this as well so write an equation uh, in the, with system to illustrate the process occurring when the second ionization of uh, energy of sodium is measured so that's going to be what that's going to be the second ionization energy so we already have first so we already have na plus right this goes to na 2 plus plus e minus now would this give me all the marks it would not right because we don't we have not added the gases gaseous gaseous state symbol so we need to write gas and gas here 
only then can we get the two the two marks so the state symbols are very important okay so the graph shows the variation in the first ionization energy the first ionization energy of some of the elements in period 3 so we have na mg al we have all of these elements but it's incomplete so on the graph use crosses to show the approximate values of the first ionization energies of the elements na p and s and then we just need to complete the graph right so what we know is that so if i can just, just go here okay so this is this is the graph right so we know that the ionization of energy of sodium is going to be lower than magnesium and aluminium right so, so let's say it's around it's around here say so if so that's our first x next we have phosphorus right phosphorus is pretty high so it's going to be higher than silicon obviously so let's say it's a phosphorus is straight line so let's say phosphorus over here then comes sulfur now the 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 cool thing about sulfur is that it does not it has a lower ionization energy than phosphorus this is this, this is one of the cases where sulfur is a, has a lower ionization energy this is to do with the half filled shell half filled shell they have right so that's why we have a lower lower ionization energy of sulfur and then obviously chlorine is much higher so i'll do the graph in blue so if we do this this is one and then here to here here to here and this is our graph this is our graph so this would give us the three marks this would give us the three marks okay so the key thing to know is there na is smaller than al and p is greater than s and s is less than cl okay so explain why the first ionization energies uh, generally increase across the period from sodium to argon some so if we're talking about sodium oh wait so if i can get if i can get the periodic table again let's get the periodic table and go back down again and I'll explain. So let's talk about sodium to argon. So we have it here. So we're talking about sodium to argon. So we're talking about from sodium all the way to argon here. So the question asking us why the ionization energies generally increase. That is because we have more protons. So the, the first thing we need to understand is as we go across the period, we need to understand that more protons are being added, right? So more protons means what for us? The proton number increase, more protons. So there is a greater, there is a greater, greater nuclear charge. We can say it's a greater nuclear charge. So that's our first point right so that's our first point greater nuclear charge okay second what, what, what else is second what's second we can say we can say what what else can we say there is a decrease in the atomic radius right we can talk about not the ionic radius the atomic radius so we can say the more protons uh, so there's a greater nuclear charge and and there is a decrease in atomic radius now i want to clarify this is atomic radius not the ionic radius so atomic radius is decreasing right then what so that means because there's a decrease so there's a decrease in atomic radius right that because of that because of that we have we have a greater this results in a greater force of attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons so this results in a greater force of attraction between the nucleus and outer 
electrons All right so that's why so so our our third point is we talk about there's a greater force of attraction between the nucleus and the outer electrons so i can just state so this is first point second point and third point okay next explain why the first ionization energy of aluminium is less than magnesium so the way the way we explain this right we have to talk about is we have to talk about what's actually going on in aluminium compared to magnesium now the only thing we know about aluminium is that it's 3p electron right it's 3p electron is being in aluminium aluminium is being lost is being lost is being lost since it is being shielded by the three three s electrons so the first point we have to talk about is that there is an outermost electron which is the 3p right the 3p electron in the aluminium and it has it it's of higher energy right it's further away from the nucleus so we say that it's the 3p electron is being lost not the 3s one the 3p electron is being lost since it is since it is being shielded by the 3s electrons so 3s electron hence why there's a aluminium's uh, ionization energy is smaller than magnesium next question we have so the first point here is 3p we talk about 3p talk about the 3p electron being lost and then the second point is that it's being shielded by the 3s electrons with the 3s electrons have higher energy so they're further away from the nucleus so the this subshell is further away from the, further away from the nucleus okay so place the following uh, species in order of increasing first ionization energy so we can see that we know that s plus goes if we go s plus right this from getting to s plus we have to do what we go from s to s plus plus e minus we're moving an ionization energy right so that means that s plus must have the highest ionization energy so that will be s plus would have the highest because we're going from s plus goes to s two plus plus e minus and we know the s minus goes to s plus e minus so you can already see that s minus has to be the lowest s has to be above s minus and the last one has to be greatest because from one mole to removing another mole of electrons is is it requires more energy than what we started with so s minus lowest s in the middle s plus highest ionization energy okay define the term covalent bond define the term now the definition that uh, the examiner report says that um, most of the candidates used was that they're talking about sharing of electrons but that doesn't if just simply referring to sharing electron doesn't give the whole uh, definition of a co covalent bond so try to be more precise and accurate so what i would say use the definition is the it is the electro static attraction attraction between two nuclei nuclei and a and the shared the shared pair of electron between them shared electron between them see the first mark is the sh electrons is the shared pair shared pair according to Marxian the, the third part is second part is the electrons between them but I would, I would still recommend use this terminology the electrostatic attraction between the two nuclei that is more precise and accurate and it will help you understand the covalent bond better than just saying it's a shared pair of electrons
So we have uh, part B, nitrogen forms an oxide called nitrous oxide N2O and then the bonding in nitrous oxide can be represented by N, triple bond N and then the coordinate bond to O. Complete the diagram below for the N2O molecule using dots or crosses to represent electrons. Just show all of the outer electrons. So this is three mark is a three marker question, right? So let's uh, let's do this. Let's let's see what happens. So let's first do the double bond, right? Let's just do the double bond. So we have here. So let's do the bond here. So there are two, and then we have X, and then we have here, and then so that's that's the five electrons they have, and the two electron goes here. It's the coordinate bond. And this is the oxygen bonds here, oxygen electrons. Why am I saying bonds? Electrons. So what marks? What are the marks that you're supposed to get? So the marks you get for is the double bond, the triple bond. Sorry, the triple bond is one mark. The dative bond is one mark, and the lone pair at the ends is one mark. So if I so this is one mark, this is one mark, and this is one mark. And obviously the outer electrons of oxygen also it it, it comes under the lone pair. Okay, so, so those are the three marks. We can move on. Question number 23. So we have standard enthalpy change of the decomposition of potassium hydrogen carbonate and potassium hydrogen, hydrogen carbonate. So let's see. This is the procedure and they're giving you lots of information. So let's see what the question is first. They, they're asking you calculate the energy absorbed in joules by the reaction of potassium hydrogen carbonate with the solution of dilute hydrochloric acid. They, they tell you what to use. They tell you what to use. They're telling you the energy, right? They're telling you what to use. So what we can do is we can just substitute in the values, right? So E equals, so the mass of the solution. How do you find out the mass of the solution? They tell you that the dilute hydrochloric acid solution is that the density is one gram per cm cubed. So every cm cubed is equivalent to one gram. So we add what? 30 centimeter cubed of HCl. So that means we're going to get to 30 centimeter cubed is equivalent to 30 HCl, right? 30, 30 grams of HCl. So this is 30 times 4.18 times. So what's the uh, temperature change? We go back up. You can see the temperature change here is minus 4.9 or just 4.9 because the temperature is 4.9. You, you would just write energy cannot be negative. So 4.4.8. 4.9 and what do we get we get if we put it in the calculator so 30 times 4.18 times 4.9 is 60 so we get 614.46 joules and that's fine but they tell uh, in the marks in the day to, they, they do tell us to reject reject 615 so you can't round upwards right you can round it to 610 so I'll the uh, you can run you can run it to 614.5 you can run it to 61110 and you can run it to 614 they're all right answers but you reject 615 joules okay and also obviously reject kilojoules because it's not a kilojoule so I, I calculate the number of moles of uh, potassium potassium hydrocarbon used assume that the molar mass of uh, potassium hydrocarbon is 100 moles so that's going to be what let's see they tell us so the mass that we actually use is 2 the molar mass is 100 so what we have to do is n equals mass of molar mass so n of k h c o 3 would be what's the mass that we use we use 2 what's the molar mass is 100 so the moles we use is 0 0.02 moles okay so that is the answer for this next question Use the answer to AI and II, so AI and II, and so to calculate the enthalpy change, right, the enthalpy change when one mole reacts completely with the acid H2. Include a sign in your answer. So we know, we know that to calculate this answer, right, we, we have to do what? The enthalpy change would be, so enthalpy change would be, would be what? It would be our answer in the first one, right? But in kilojoules, this has to be energy in kilojoules divided by the moles, correct? So then the kilojoules would be, so 614 divided by 1000, that would give us the kilojoules, divided by the moles, which is 0 0.02, right? 
So let's see what we get. So we get, so this is 0 0.614 divided by 0 0.02, right? So you get what? So if you do 0 0.614 divided by, divided by 0 0.02, you get 30.7. Now, that's one part of the answer, right? That's one part of the answer. It's not all of it, it's one point. We now need to know what sign we need to add. So we, let's go back up and determine whether this is, a, this is an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. So you can see the temperature is it's going down, it's negative. So what's, what's happening here? By negative, I mean it's going down, it's decreasing, the value is decreasing, it's getting colder. So what's happening? It's taking heat in. It's taking heat in from the surroundings, from surroundings. Now, what's that a classic example of? It's, a, it's, an, it's an example of an endothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction. Which we know has a positive enthalpy sign, right? Positive sign. So we know that we need to add a positive here. It's very important that we add the positive. Because if we don't, we don't get the mark. So that is the answer for this. Let's move on. Part B. Part B says... The Hess cycle, uh, Hess cycle based on this reaction is here. Okay, uh, apply the Hess law to obtain H1 in terms of H2 and H3. So, what are they really doing here, right? What What are they trying to tell us? This is H1, right? So we know that we have to do delta H1 plus something, and it equals this one, this one over here, right? That's what we do know, correct? So this is obviously. This is what this is delta h3 right two times that correct if you go back up you can see delta h3 is what delta h3 so delta h3 is the k2co3 this is the delta h3 value we this is the delta h3 right so we can we can just do this for our convenience so copy this let's go back down here and then we can just paste it so so we know which one's which So we know which one is which. This all so. So this reaction is the K2CO3 plus two HCl is uh, delta H3. So it's two times this, right? So if we can do if if, if I can do this, so this is two times this, and this one is what this is. Uh, this is two K. It's potassium hydrogen carbonate decomposing to this. This is the, uh, the second one, yeah, second one over here. So we get, so we get here, this is two times delta H2. So we can label it as one, two, and three. And we can say two plus three equals one. And we want what two is, so two equals one take away three that is what we're doing so one take away three so that's going to be that's going to be two times delta h2 take away two and delta h3 that is the answer so use your answer to part i i b i to calculate the answer so that would be delta h1 would be so this is two times uh two times let's see so three, we have 30.7, that's our H2, isn't it? So two times 30.7 positive, and take away minus 34. So that gives us a value of, so we have two times 30.7, take away 34, that gives us 95.4. So this is positive, 95.4 kilojoules per mole. So again, the sign matters a lot. So that is our two marks here. Okay, so answer and then the positive sign. Part C we have is the error of the balance. Calculate the maximum percentage error. So we have used the balance twice, once for the mass of uh, uh, potassium hydrogen carbonate and once for the other mass. That we take, we take two mass readings. Yeah, massive it's used and then 
because we add it in both solids we add to separate so this we have two we have solids they added to separate so we have two of these separate uh, hydrochloric acid tubes and because of that we we take the balance twice so we know so we can conclude and say that 0 0.01 that's our gram that we use and divided by the two grams that we have right it's plus or minus and two times that we do two times because we take the balance twice times it by a hundred percent right so you get get plus or minus one percent that is our answer here measuring cylinder how many times do we take the measuring cylinder we take it only once so 0 0.5 divided by 30 times 100 so you only take it once right 0 0.5 divided by 100 so that gives us 1.67 percent okay so just a piece of apparatus that could have been used to measure the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid more accurately so we use the measuring cylinder so what we can use a more a, a better piece of equipment that could have been it could have been a burette burette or a pipette the volumetric ones obviously so that these both answers are recognized and are correct 24a state the general formula for alkanes uh, so the alkanes are usually cn h 2 n plus 2 and if you forget you can always remember ch4 and then compare it to c2h4 and see the pattern so you can see the pattern here c2h6 so you can see here this is c2h6 this is c uh, h4 you can see the pattern here to here and you can keep going until you find and you can remember the pattern you can see this um, this is increasing by one cn this is increasing by h 2n plus two so just you can always remember it by drawing the diagrams and remembering it again so that is the answer for this so name this type of reaction so we have an alkane right we have an alkane that goes on to find to to break down into a more useful hydrocarbon which is this uh, smaller chain alkene and a smaller alkane this type of reaction is called cracking next we have an alkane that 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 produces a cyclohexane and hydrogen a lot in the marks in the in the examiner report they tell us that many people did not know what this type of reaction is when in fact this reaction is called a refor reformation reaction reformation reaction so what type of formula are the organic molecules in B represented so these types of formulae this type of formula are called skeletal so you can just write skeletal okay another reaction carried out in the industry can be represented by the following give the molecular formula for compound 2 now they ask for the molecular formula they're not asking they're not asking for a name or, or specific displayed formula so we just have to do is just count how many carbons there are so one two so one two three four five six seven eight nine so we know it's c9 and then if you go in you can just uh, count three so this would be one two three four five six seven eight nine ten the four ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty so we know this is going to be c9 h20 okay give the compound for two for give the name of compound two now now we need to look at the longest chain so one two to one this 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 is the longest chain I can think of so because of that so that's going to be what so that's going to be one two three four so let me just make it more clear so we now need to name this and so now we need to find the longest chain the longest chain in this case would be this or or this they're both the same because we have both of the same uh, ethyl groups attached to the longest chain so let's go with this and we can see where the longest group is attached to so this is our longest chain so this is one two three four five six this is uh, a hexane so 
So we know the at the end we're gonna get hexane, right? We're gonna he get hexane. That's what we know. Now, if we were to label this one, this would be two, this would be three, this would be four, five, and six. That's so we would get three ethyl. We, we would get three ethyl. So in this case, we get three ethyl, right? Because this is this is an ethyl group over here, and we get a methyl at four. So three ethyl. 4 methyl, so 4 methyl hexane, right? Now, why did I do 3 ethyl, 4 methyl, and not uh, 4 methyl, e uh, 3 ethyl? They're both correct, but r usually in I IUPAC naming system, we try to be as alphabetic in an, al in an alphabetical order. So, in this case, you can see E, we have 3 ethyl, so E comes further it comes before the alphabet before m that's why it's 3 ethyl 4 methyl hexane okay let's go down so we have this an equation for the reaction between methane and chlorine mean the chlorine is as follows so they give us step a and step b they tell us find the enthalpy change for step a and then we change for step a and they're asking us for the enthalpy change in step B. So the way we do it again is bonds broken plus, so bonds broken plus, so we have bonds broken. So let's see what bonds are broken here. So you can see over here in the first one, we have the bonds of CH is broken. One CH is broken. What else is broken? Plus, what else is broken? We have HCl is being formed, right? So this uh, HCl is being formed. So this is broken, so th this is a positive sign. This is, this is 413. This is being made, so it's a, it already has a negative sign. So HCl is 432. So when we add this, we get minus 19. Okay, same thing again. So what's being broken down? So you can see what's being broken down here. For this one, again, a, a CH is being broken down. So let me just list as a broken down. This is being made. This is why negative. This is our positive. Same thing again. So broken down. So it's already there. So broken down. And this one is plus. And what are we making this time? We are making a carbon to carbon to Cl bond here. So where this is being made, so it's going to be negative here. So this is going to be 346. This is going to be our 413 from, from the table itself, the given to us. So this would be 413 take away 346. This gives us plus 67 kilojoules per mole. Use your answer to part I to justify which of the steps is more likely. All right? Which which steps are more likely? So, what do you think? We we usually step A is what is exothermic, right? Doesn't take in energy; it gives off energy, so it's more energetically favorable. So you can say that step A is more energetically energetically favorable because. It is an exothermic reaction because it is an exothermic reaction. Exothermic reaction. The key thing here is that it's it's more energetically favorable. That is the main thing here, and that is due to the fact that that it's the negative sign you can see here. It's an exothermic reaction. Okay, so the. The last question, another halogen alkane, bromomethane, is a toxic gas used to protect plants against insects. Health and safety advice states that concentration above 5 parts per million, so that is 5 over 1, 000, 1 million, is 1 million now. A research library contains 2.5 times 10 dm cubed of air. Calculate the maximum value uh, volume of bromomethane allowed. 
So we know maximum allowed is 5 ppm, right? So we know that going to be 5 ppm of this amount. So all we have to do is times this by 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5. And when we use a calculator for this, you get, what do you get? You get, check, so 5 over a million times 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5. You get 1.25. So our answer is 1.25 dm cubed of bromoethane. That is the answer and that is the last question. This is now the end of the video. Hope you guys found this more understanding and uh, please uh, like, subscribe and share around to people that, that may benefit from, from this video and other videos that are upcoming. Thank you.